I went round to some friend's flat the other night, right? I got up to the flat, talking about drugs, I got up to the flat, right? And I noticed a sickly sweet smell. <laughs> sickly sweet bloody smell. <laughs> I thought, aye, aye, I thought, aye, aye, spam for tea. <laughs> <laughs> and then I saw them, the extra long nine skin gold wires, dick compensators they was rolling. <laughs> I said, Byron. I said, how do you manage to get the spam in there? And then I realised what was happening. I said, I'm hip to this groove, daddy-o, 23 skidoo, rock around the crocodile, man. So they all ignored me, you know. I sat down on the Habitat Pine scatter cushions. Because the one before had really made the career of Rowan Atkinson, I thought, well, it's going to do the same for me, irrespective of the fact that I was extraordinarily aggressive, you know quite difficult to work with, uh, you know, not from Oxford or Cambridge. Too, if you eat the fuckers. Uh, didn't quite work out like that, but, <laughs> but certainly I saw it as a career opportunity. The lifestyle in Stoke Newington is terribly alternative, you know, but there's one thing about the scene I can't get behind, and that is all the people taking drugs and not giving me any of the bastards. <laughs> the stuff I was doing. It's all about lifestyle and, you know, but that was all new then, you know, nobody had done that stuff before about drugs and about the kind of clothes that they wore and, you know, it was just revolutionary then. And the chunky jumper in the suit with a tailored pocket with a calculator, <laughs> all telling racy stories about commodity investment. <laughs> but to see Lexi doing What's On In Stoke Newington, it was quite an anarchic thing to have in there, because it was very unapologetically punk, Lexi's performance in that. And it was pretty sensational. I mean, it was legendary. So I had one toke of this dope, right? Just one toke. I was paralysed from the waist down. I lost the use of my fingers. And I developed every single symptom of typhoid. It was fucking amazing. And they're all going, oh, fucking amazing. Oh, fucking fantastic. Oh, save the shrimp, man, you. Yeah. The thing that, that was original about me, unlike the comics generally, they have a desperate need for approval, you know, and they want the audience to like them. And I genuinely, genuinely didn't care if the audience liked well, In fact, I liked it if they didn't like me. I wanted them to laugh, but I would actually goad them, you know. I was often very, very aggressive. Modest man, it's like being inside a 50s radio, isn't it? <laughs> See him all peddling away, you know, and look, look, he's not even a social worker. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly you had this very attitudinal stance that alternative performers could take. The idea of the privileged classes coming onto the stage and being funny in an intellectual way had been slowly subverted by other folks from the red brick universities and from the secondary moderns who also had something funny to say and who also believed that the abuse of human rights uh, was wrong. So suddenly this thing started to become a broader church. <laughs> I feel like Buster Loose with some bad jokes. I feel like Buster Loose with some bad jokes. Uh, I don't think anybody had ever gone to the trouble before of orchestrating, you know, four jokes like this. And I'm a funketeer, so it was a no-brainer to say, well, why don't you, why don't you have a, a like a Chuck, Chuck Brown and the Soul Searchers backing track for these jokes? <laughs> we had backing singers. We had funk musicians, we had all sorts, and it was a really good fun to do. A man was in a hospital bed. Oh, good God. The doctor said, I've got some good news uh, and some bad news. The man said, I watch the bad news. And the doc said, we've had to amputate both your legs. He said, ooh, good God. What's the good news? And the doc said, the man in the next bed wants to buy your slippers. And it sort of summed up the amnesty thing as well, which is this thing of combining music with jokes. And the audience really, I don't think they'd ever had funk in an amnesty show before. So it was, you know, I bought the funk to the barbed wire candle. It was great. A man walked into a barber shop. A man walked into a barber shop. He said, I want you to cut my hair. Just like Michael Jackson. See, that's how, that's how this dates. God almighty. Wouldn't want your hair like Michael Jackson there, would you? <laughs> when he woke up, he was completely bald. Just like this guy. He said, Baba! I think I'm 
one of the first black people to be on Amnesty. You know, there might have been a singer, but there, there definitely wasn't a comedian. So for the, you know, for the first time, there was a black guy on stage being funny rather than having people talk about him being in jail. <laughs> so it was quite, so it was quite good. We toured all the way around the deep south and there was a lot of segregation going around. We weren't allowed to play in the same room as white folks. Used to have to play in a little broom cupboard down the hall. They used to send the applause back in a little envelope. I get to perform black characters that come from the community and talk about, in a, in a joshing way, about things that you know, things like oppression and slavery, and I get those jokes in and people go, <laughs> but they're a bit, you know... Yeah, comedians get the, have the opportunity to do that. I think there is a relationship between comedy and human rights in the sense that comedians understand censorship. Comedians understand how wrong it is for people not to be allowed to express their mind. One of the things that is so essential in being a comedian is absolute freedom of speech, and I mean absolute. And therefore... I suppose comedians are amongst the first to be deeply distressed at the idea of those who are imprisoned or in some way stifled or indeed tortured uh, for speaking their mind, um, for thinking and communicating freely. So it's a kind of primal insult to the very energy that makes a comedian, I think. I think comedy has always been a way of escaping from your environment. I mean, the world presses in on you, and if you can get it into laugh, the, the bullies run away. And if you can, uh, you know, you can get other people to laugh, you sort of let out the, oh, I'm out, I'm free at last. So there's, I think there's something to do with that. You just knew that, oh, this is going to stop somebody being tortured? Yeah, I'll do that, you know. Somebody's going to get stoned? What? <laughs> oh, not stoned like that, like that. Jesus Christ, let's stop it now. You know, we'll help, you know.